This is a Hyundai or Hyundai Ioniq 5, and it's one of the techiest cars on the market. I mean, you can tell by the styling. It has a sort of retro-futuristic look that really kind of hints at the fact that this is a rather tech-infused car. Everything from the headlights to especially those sorts of dot matrix, you know, pixel-style rear, rear lights, even the pixel sort of uh, little dots around, like on the steering wheel, just kind of everywhere on the car, gives this a very unique and very cool aesthetic. I think what's most surprising though is just how big this car is. I mean, I'm six foot tall and it's not that far off as tall as me. It's also like weirdly perfectly proportioned. The reason that this looks like a small car from a distance is because everything is scaled up. These wheels, they're 20 inch rims with standard aspect ratio tires. So what that means is they look normal in proportion. Once you get up close, you realize just how massive this thing is and how it is very much an SUV or at very least a crossover in height and an overall size. The biggest surprise for me, especially while driving this though, was the width. This thing is 10 centimeters wider wheel to wheel than my Audi S4 Estate. That's massive! Now in terms of practicality, I'm happy to say that this model, at least the uh, single motor rear wheel drive version, does have a front trunk or a frunk as it's known. Uh, it's not the biggest amount of space in the world, but it is enough to store things like your charging cables quite happily or anything you might want to store a little bit more securely than just in the boot, for example. When it comes to the rear boot space, you have obviously a power folding rear tailgate, both open and close, you can open it from the uh, the remotes. And in here, you have 527 liters of space, or if you fold the seats down, you get about 1500. What surprised me the most here was how little vertical space you get. Because this is a, a rear motored car and the uh, optional sound system under here isn't helping that much, the load floor is very flat, which is good for loading things in, but it's not very good for having a lot of stuff in here. I also found out the hard way that the rear sliding parcel shelf only folds upwards, which then restricts your rear visibility if you have anything taller than, well, the rear parcel shelf or the rear cover, because there's some knobs that don't let it fold down that way. I found out the hard way because I ended up buying an air conditioning unit and I thought, what a great way to test the practicality of this thing than to go and actually put it in the boot of this and. Well, it turns out that it didn't really fit. Now, there is plenty of space in here for your regular shopping and all that sort of stuff, but it's certainly a little bit on the lacking side compared to, I mean, my obvious comparison is the one I'm most used to, my Audi S4, but, um, yeah. You do have some extra space back here, including for your AC charging cables, the ones that the chargers don't have cables pre-attached, and you do have some space under the boot floor as well, including for your tower mobility kit, the three pin AC charger that comes with the car, and the vehicle to load adapter, which is a really cool thing. And if you wanna hear more about how it all works, check out the tech video that should be coming out, I think next week, over on my tech channel, TechTeamGB. Up in the front of the Ionic 5, is a nice place to be. You have a, a pretty nice fit and finish overall. The glove box is a little bit on the, the cheaper side, but everything else feels really nice. This is a very well-equipped car with a load of different tech features and all that sort of stuff. And if you're interested in seeing a video specifically about just the tech in the car, I'll leave a link to that in the links above, that's over on my tech channel, TechTeamGB. There are a few things that I didn't mention on that in that video though, like the uh, seat adjustments. That might not seem like a very, you know, interesting thing to talk about. It's a fully electrically adjusted seat. But there is one little dial here, which if I, uh, if I hold that down, you might think that I'm just going backwards, and currently I am, but in a second, it's gonna start tilting the backrest and lifting the little uh, rear leg support up for me. And uh, once it's finished doing that, you can keep adjusting it until <laughs> you have a full lie flat position. I am lying down with my feet up in the front of an Ionic 5. And uh, I guess this is for if you fancy a nap, maybe, you know, while you're waiting for a charger, but um, it's quite a nice place to be. A little more seriously though, this is a very nice place to be. You have uh, ventilated and heated 
uh, seats. The ventilated part is very nice on hot summer days like this. Unfortunately, that's only available on the driver's seats. Your passenger doesn't get such luxury, only heated seats for them. Uh, but, you know, it's a very, very nice place to be. I mentioned that this model has the heat pump, and that's a really big thing, especially for winter. Essentially, a heat pump is just an air conditioning unit that can go either way. It can either take heat from inside the car and take it outside, which is air conditioning, or it can take heat from outside and put it inside, which is the heat pump aspect. That means that even in winter, you should have a lot better efficiency than a car that doesn't have a heat pump because it'll have to use resistive heating, which while 100% efficient, heat pumps can be up to three times, like 300% efficient in terms of the heat they generate. So that is a very, very good thing. It does also have things like the preheating of the battery, especially when you're getting to a fast charger, especially if it knows you're going to a fast charger, uh, and a, a few things like that to make your sort of convenience, and especially during winter, a bit of a, a better experience. Something else I should mention is how much sort of open space there is. The windshield is remarkably far away, which gives the cabin quite a nice airy and open feel. You don't have a drive tunnel in the middle, rather obviously, so while you do have a central armrest with a little bit of storage in it, and then a massive amount of storage down at the bottom, as well as the wireless charger, you do also have quite a lot of open space in the middle and another little storage bin down at the bottom there too. So this is a very nice and open, spacious feeling cabin. Uh, in terms of the seat's comfort, uh, for longer drives, this has been great. It's ho it holds me in nicely enough, but it's not tight. It's not a, a sports racing seat, but it does give me a lot of support. The ventilated seats are just beautiful. I, I, I really don't know how I'm going to live without them. But, you know, it's, it's a nice feel. It's supportive, but, uh, you know, still soft and comfortable enough. And so, yeah, this is a very nice place to be. When it comes to rear seat comfort, it's really not bad in here. I have plenty of leg room and I'm six feet tall. I do have my head rubbing up against the uh, against the roof, but I mean, if I slouch a little bit, which is arguably the more comfortable position for me anyway, that's decent enough. This is a relatively wide car, so you have plenty of room back here. There is a middle seat if you want to, although there is also the armrest, which does have some nice cup holders in it, which is always good. There are a couple of extra features back here too. Your air vents are actually in the uh, the B pillars over here, which should mean you get much better airflow than if it's you know down here somewhere. You also get two charging USB ports. There is a plug socket down here, which is part of the accessory power. So if you want to run a little mini fridge or something, it's a like three pin UK plug down here that you enable in the center console. You've got the ISO fix points for your kids. And yeah, it's quite nice. You even have heated seats in the back. That's not bad. And as if that weren't enough, these rear bench seats, they slide. Like I said, if you have, uh, if you need some more cargo space in the back and you don't mind losing some of your uh, rear leg room, you can do that. And also the, uh, the sort of seat folding mechanism, it's actually a seat adjustment mechanism. You can have these bolt upright, it locks in place. It's not very comfortable, but again, if you want some more room, but still need to put something back here, you can do that. And there is actually a couple of different positions that they can lock in as well. Now, I don't really know why you wouldn't just put them all the way back. It's the most comfortable position, but that option is there. When it comes to actually driving the Ionic 5, pretty nice. It's a pretty nice and refined experience. This is the 228 PS or 168 kilowatt rear wheel drive version with the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery. That is the sort of, I guess, middle spec if you like, uh, because there is a higher spec with 325 PS and all wheel drive. But even this, uh, this 228, it's got some pretty decent go. Um, it will happily get you up to speed into dual carriageways and slip roads like this. I would say that it does lack a little bit of the fun that I had in the 325 PS version at the SMMT day last year, but it's still plenty nippy. It's still, I would say, utilitarian 
in its power. It has plenty for the sort of safety aspect, although it isn't necessarily the most fun you could have in a car. Something that can help with that fun aspect though, is changing the drive mode with the selector on the steering wheel. You can go from the eco mode, which is a very sedated throttle response, but obviously relatively eco-friendly into the normal mode, which is what I've been driving around in, you know, with this for the majority of my time. But if you do want to have a little bit more fun, you can swap it into the sport mode where the, the gauges turn red and you get, well, the same amount of power overall, but a much sharper throttle response any amount of pushing on the pedal and it really does lurch you around. Uh, so you do need to be a bit more careful, but it does mean that you do get a sharper throttle response, which especially for trying to pull out of junctions or join, you know, motorways or whatever, uh, you don't have to be quite as aggressive with your right foot to get the same amount of power, which I personally prefer. Of course, one of the most important points of uh, an electric vehicle these days is how the regen braking is handled. When I say regen braking, if you're new to electric vehicles, with an internal combustion engine, when you let off the accelerator, what the engine does is stop putting fuel in so that the engine just acts as an air pump and a brake. But you're not necessarily recouping any fuel, you're just not using any. With an electric car, the motor can either act as a motor to push you forward or as a generator, so when you lift off, you start to slow down and it uses that slowing down of the momentum of the car to regenerate electricity and put that back into the battery. This car regen brakes relatively hard, although there are paddles on the back of the steering wheel to adjust the regen amount. I personally like to have it on its maximum amount so that when you lift off, it's basically braking as hard as it can. The good news though, is that the brake lights do actually come on when you are just regen braking, which is something that not all manufacturers can claim to. And that's a very good thing, especially for safety and for the, I think the new EU regulations as well. So we're currently regen braking. We're coming to a stop basically as fast as I would do it. And if you want a bit of extra stop, you can also hold the paddle on the left-hand side for a bit of extra braking force too. And of course, the regen braking isn't quite as hard as, you know, an emergency stop or anything. You will still use the friction brakes every once in a while, but for the vast majority of driving, especially in the maximum regen mode, you never need to touch the brakes. It is also worth noting that with the brake pedal, the very first part of that travel does actually modulate the regen braking. So uh, just gently pressing the brake pedal, even with the maximum regen mode, does mean that you get a bit of extra braking force that's still purely from the motor. This is great, especially for the sort of maintenance aspect, because the less you use the friction brakes, the less you're going to need to maintain them, and the more energy you're recouping from, you know, the, the motors, uh, which all ends up being a pretty good thing. The only downside to the regen braking is that there doesn't seem to be a, a one pedal driving mode. I believe it was called iPedal. I can't seem to find that option uh, either in eco mode, sport or normal using the paddles to adjust it. I, I know that that was how you did it because I did that with both I think the Ionic 5 last year and the Ionic 6 this year at the SMMT test day, but that doesn't seem to be an option on this car, which I think is a bit of a shame because the one pedal driving modes on electric vehicles are really very nice and well, I do understand that, especially for people who are just jumping into an electric car for the first time, the muscle memory of putting your foot on the brake and slowing the car down is you know, a very ingrained one and unlikely a good thing to keep, in, you know, keep as a, a habit. The one pedal driving modes are really nice and so the fact that that doesn't seem to be here is a bit of a shame. When it comes to the handling of the Ionic 5, it's a bit of a weird one. This car weighs pr pretty much two tons. Uh, which is um, a little on the high side, especially for a car of this size. Now, most of that weight is really down low, and so I feel a lot more secure in this, despite how high the seating and sort of driving position is. The weight is something that I definitely notice while, you know, bringing it through some corners, and 
while that's not necessarily a bad thing, and I think Honda have done a good job of the overall suspension to make this still, you know, grip very well, uh, and still not, you know, there's not too much in the way of body roll. There definitely is some, but it's not the sort of lumping around corners like a land yacht. Uh, but this definitely feels on the softer side. Being a more SUV sort of everyday family car, it's clearly, clearly designed to be a little on the softer side, a little uh, more uh, forgiving. But because of the weight, the springs and damping do have to be relatively firm, which does mean that you still get a little bit of a, not a harsh ride, but it's more noticeable that you're in a heavier car for sure. When it comes to some fun roads though, you can still have a decent amount of fun in this, which is kind of remarkable considering the weight and the sort of suspension. You do have to contend with all the driver aids, as I'll talk about in a second, and you'll hear beeping, but it's still pretty fun. It handles well, it grips well, and I have remarkable amount of confidence, especially considering the weight of this thing. Of course, in normal driving, you're not really going to notice just how well this thing handles, despite its weight, but I can say that I'm remarkably happy with how it handles. Realistically, your more rear-wheel driving is stuff like this, and you know, your potentially little jaunts on dual carriageways and motorways as we're just coming up to. And for that, it's a pretty nice experience. You do feel a decent amount of the, the bumps and lumps on the road, but it is still disconnected enough that it's not a, uh, a draining or wearing experience at all. And so I'm pretty happy with the sort of ride quality of the Ionic 5. In terms of the sort of quality, especially while driving, the road noise is certainly uh, noticeable, especially because this is an EV and so you don't have things like an engine and you know an exhaust note to be able to uh, drown that out. But I think they've done a pretty good job of making this feel like a premium cabin. All of the materials generally feel pretty nice, save for the glove box. Uh, you know, all of the, the door cards are this sort of, I think, faux leather type thing. The steering wheel is a sort of soft touch, faux plastic leather, whatever. Uh, and all of the general materials that you'd actually interact with feel pretty nice. There are a couple of little rattles that you might hear, namely from the back seats and the rear seat belts. They, because of the rear seats are sort of sliding and adjustable, they're not attached to the, the rear fender wells like they are in a lot of other cars, and that means that the seat belts are free to slip down the side of them and then rattle in there. That can be a little annoying, and so if you don't regularly have backseat passengers, I would personally recommend just attaching or plugging in the seat belts in the bag so that you will not hear those rattle, and, uh, and you'll have a nicer experience while driving this. One thing that does end up being a bit of a frustration for me when driving this uh, is the driver aids, and specifically the lane assistant. What I've found is that it seems to think it knows best quite a lot of the time, and despite this being a single country road, it just tried to steer me into the other lane. Uh, and so what ends up happening is it will take control away from me, it will try and steer the car before I, it's even sensible to take a turn, or if I want to change lanes, it will rip me into the other lane, which is really worrying. This road has been by far the worst example of that for me, where on these corners that are coming up, it will, <laughs> it will turn the car before the corner is there, and it is, it is absolutely horrifying to be driving in the car and have to fight the steering wheel to keep it on the road. It's steering me into the- look, I'm not steering, it just steered me into the other lane. That, that should not happen. And the most frustrating thing about that is that that setting is only available to turn off through settings and then vehicle when it responds and then lane safety and then you can put it on warning or off. And the even worse part about that is that if I turn the car off and then turn it back on again, that setting has reset itself. You cannot disable this feature permanently as far as I can tell. There may be a coding option or, you know, some other regions might not have it, I, I don't know, but as far as I can find in the settings, you can only turn it off for the specific time you're in that car, that one time, and you would have to turn that setting off every single time. That feature is great for motorways. That's clearly what it's designed for, but on twisty country roads like this, it is an active danger to me, and you can't turn it off. 
I, I really would like that to be at very least geofenced to dual carriageways and motorways. If not, just respect my setting and, and let me turn it off. I think overall, this is a very nice place to be. It's a relatively refined experience, despite the seatbelts rattling in the back. The driver aids can be frustrating, but they can also be quite nice and uh, I'm sure I've said already but if you want to see more videos on the uh, more tech in the car and the driver aids and sort of semi self driving stuff that this car has check out the videos over on my tech channel Tech Team GB. I have two full videos already up on those topics so do check them out but remarkable uh, like, sort of regardless of that the driver aids can be a useful addition especially the adaptive cruise control that does do full stop and go it can be a little bit difficult to trust at times, but it is a, a nice feature to have, especially for that motorway driving. The tech in here is great. You know, you have full Android Auto and Apple CarPlay if you want it, although the built-in you know, system, the infotainment system, is arguably nice enough on its own, and especially because it has things like the charger locations and you know, function use and rates all built in. That's something that I would feel like I would be missing if I were using, you know, Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. And so it is pretty, a pretty nice system. The fact that the climate controls are touchscreen buttons is something that I'm not a massive fan of. I would like to see them as physical dials, especially for those sorts of things where you would want to adjust it while you're driving, but you don't necessarily want to take your eyes off the road to press some buttons that you very much have to look at to know where they are. Um, but it's still nice that there are still some and that it's not purely done in the infotainment system. When it comes to the range and efficiency, the car is quoted at uh, anywhere between about 250 and I think 315 miles, depending on the model and obviously your, your driving sort of style and, and habits. Um, we currently have 77% charge and it says that we have 199 miles of range and I've been generally getting about 3.2 to 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour, which isn't all that bad. Despite this being a fairly large you know, size vehicle, especially relatively tall and therefore fairly large frontal area, uh, this is still remarkably efficient. And I think, like I said, the, the single rear wheel drive uh, 228 PS model is the one to go for. It gives you plenty of power, but still gives you a good amount of, of efficiency and therefore range from this. Of course, the charging is, because there's an 800 volt battery, you can have up to 350 kilowatt DC fast charging. You might struggle to find those right now, but you can basically charge it as fast as a fast charger will allow, which is always good. You can also do up to 10.5 kilowatt hours of AC charging if that's what you're after. Uh, you do get a charger literally in the boot actually, just your standard three pin for up to about three kilowatts of charging. Or you can use a wall box for up to normally about seven in the UK, but the charger can handle up to 10. What that means is this is very close to, if not basically the ideal sort of family vehicle. You can do longer journeys in it. And by the time you know your, your kids want to stop off at the services for a, a bathroom break and a snack, well, this thing can charge up to almost full in, you know, that sort of time, 15 to 30 or so minutes, uh, which is plenty for this sort of range that it can do and the uh, sort of, well, charging speeds. I think overall, this is a pretty nice car to, to be in, to drive, and as a, a relatively practical vehicle. You of course have things like the front trunk and a reasonable amount of boot space. You have plenty of comfort up front, including, at least in this model, the lay flat seats if you need to, I don't know, sleep at a charger or something. And you do have even the adjustable rear seats. The extra features like the vehicle to load adapter is a really cool addition on top of the plug socket that's actually just between the rear seats as well. That's a different setting, uh, the sort of accessory power. Uh, and I think the only real downside is the price tag. As spec, this is uh, about £52,500, which is quite a lot of money to spend on a car. Of course, in the EV world, it weirdly kind of isn't. It's sort of middle priced, uh, you know, with things like BMW's i4 being starting at £50,000, whereas this is the ultimate edition with all of the optional extras and that sort of stuff, the, the fancy paint. 
Uh, and so what you get for your money here in the land of, of EVs is quite a nice car. I think some of the things like the driver aids and assistance that I can't seem to permanently turn off might be a bit of a deal breaker for me personally, but I can also see them being a very useful addition, especially to a family or, you know, that sort of thing. Just an extra peace of mind, an extra, you know, hand looking out for you. Um, and so I think overall, this is a pretty nice car and while there are a few things that I would like to see you know, addressed in say firmware updates, I can definitely recommend it. It's a very nice place to be and a remarkably decent value for being an EV. But with all of that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think about the Hyundai or Hyundai Ioniq 5? Is this a car you would be interested in yourself? Would you go for the lower, sleeker, but I guess slightly less practical Ioniq 6 or something else entirely? Let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos like this one, do hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. And if you want to check out more videos, both from Hyundais like this, uh, and more uh, sort of repairs, guides, a load of other stuff, check out those videos on the end cards. If you're interested in supporting the channel, there's some links in the description, including merch hoodies or t-shirts like this one, and a load of other designs I made myself. And otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.